Welcome, oh. everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Master Gardener program. We are taking a look at some Florida-friendly landscaping with our pal Michael from the Extension Office, who specializes in the Florida-friendly landscaping program. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Lisa, uh, for all your assistance in helping out today. Um, again, yeah, my name is Michael Masucci. I'm from the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Hillsborough County. I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator there, where I help Lynn Barber, who's our Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent. I really help residents um, reduce kind of their stormwater uh, runoff uh, by managing our landscaping with our Florida Friendly principles, uh, which we're going to go over today. So the University of Florida is a um, equal opportunity institution. And now that we've covered that, there we go. And it is working. So welcome. We're going to go over today is going to be talking about the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. Um, now it's working. Sorry, my computer kind of skipped there. All right. No problem. It looks like we might still have, need to get your screen share up. But remember, is folks, uh, oh. while Michael's getting his screen share up and so running sorry. for you, just uh, type those questions in into the chat box as we go along. Uh, I will be keeping an eye on that. There we go. We got that slide sorry coming up. That. No problem. So remember, keep those keep those questions coming in and I'll be in the background. Okay, awesome. So yeah, let me just go over this again. This is the University of Florida IFAS Extension. We're an equal opportunity institution. And here we go. Now we're going to go into nine principles is what I'm calling this. Uh, it's a Florida friendly landscaping uh, presentation. And again, I'm Michael Masucci with the University of Florida Extension Hillsborough County. So some objectives that we're going to go over, we're going to learn more about the nine fl uh, Florida friendly landscaping principles, dive into each one, and kind of get you guys started understanding a little bit about each. I'm going to share some Florida-friendly landscaping techniques with you guys, and hopefully at the end of this, uh, you guys can improve your gardening and landscape experience and have a little bit more fun out there. Um, everything with Florida-friendly landscaping, or FFL, uh, what we try to do with the nine principles is guide homeowners on creating and maintaining environmentally friendly landscapes by embracing principles of non-native and uh, native and non-native adapted plants, uh, picking or uh, recycling our, our waste by composting and all over just trying to sustain our landscaping. So it's an integrated approach to maintain an attractive and colorful and diverse yard. We wanna be friendly to wildlife. We wanna attract pollinators and such. Uh, everything has been backed by the University of Florida. All of this is science-based solutions. And uh, it's ultimately the goal is to conserve natural resources and protect our water quality. So in 19, uh, 2009, sorry, uh, the Florida Friendly Landscaping worked with the Florida legislation team and created statute 373-185. And there's a, a quick quote from it is quality or Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, means quality landscapes that can serve water, protect the environment, adaptable to local conditions and are drought tolerant. And it's really important that Florida kind of came together with the university to kind of get this in legislation because this kind of set this, the grounds on us kind of working into with HOAs and getting this set as a kind of a, a standard of what we want, where we can take landscaping. Uh, um, something that's near and dear in my heart is, is, this, is this legislation. So ultimately now, it's about water quality. That's our environmental concern here. The reason being is because one of Florida's greatest natural resources is our water. Uh, picture to the right on this slide is a, is a beautiful picture of our Floridian aquifer uh, doing its thing, being beautiful and preserving our water. Uh, we don't want to pollute this by misuse of fertilizers and pesticides. Those care are, are one of the biggest contributors that we we have found that fall into our waterways. Uh, over fertilizing, fertilizing when we have a heavy rain can cause it just to go straight into our our, our storm drains, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And uh, the big concern is the population of Florida is expected to double by 2060, so there's an increased demand for water and also protecting that. And so the Florida Friendly Landscaping Nine Principles are right plant, right place, water efficiently. Fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pest responsibly, recycle yard debris, 
reduced stormwater runoff, and ultimately to protect the waterfront. Again, we use native and non-native adaptive plants in hopes to protect our Florida's uh, water resources. We want to reduce the fertilizer waste by promoting recycling of our yard waste by composting. Uh, that keeps like a lot of it out of our waterways, really. And uh, we can support local wildlife, promoting lush growth of our plants, and also still being um, appealing and uh, functional in the landscape. So aesthetics do play big parts of it. We're going to start with right plant, right place, and what that kind of ties into meaning. So when we when we say right plant, right place, we're talking about choosing the right plant for the right location, and we mean to take in a whole kind of. Um, we're looking at a lot of things there. We're looking at the size of the plant when it's going to become full maturity, the light requirements that it might need, sun, shade, partial. You're looking at the water requirements. Is this a plant that can take a lot of water? Is this a plant that can stand a lot of drought? Uh, you want to also look at the soil conditions and then also wind tolerance. Uh, we sometimes get some wind. So you want these to be placed in areas that they can take a wind if it was like in a corridor or such. Um, and ultimately, we want these to, uh, to be maintained and um, if you have turf areas, functional turf is kind of what we would like to see it reduced to. Uh, you could still have kind of a, a, a full out uh, lawn. It's still fine like that if it's functional, if you're using it, if the family's running around. But we really want that reduced if possible. Uh, if you can't in certain areas grow grass or certain shaded areas, you know, turf grass alternatives are perfect for that. Shrubs and ground covers, those work best in those situations. Trees and shrubs, we want to see them positioned to improve the heating and cooling of the bu building. If you look in the photo that I have here of the house up in the top right, you see that the, there's uh, some oaks in the front and we have some on the back that are, are, are perfectly surrounding this house, providing a lot of shade throughout all of the day. So we have from the morning to the sun, um, morning to the, um, the evening, sorry, it's blocking the sun from the house, which is probably reducing a lot of the, the bills from there, keeping a nice cool house. And ultimately now they're located away from the foundation not growing on to them so with right plant right place we have some terms sun and shade you've all seen kind of a garden tag at the garden store and you you know right away it says like full sun and you know what really does that mean so for full sun in florida it kind of can translate to meaning it'll take six hours or more of direct sun ultimately the EM sum is a little bit more heavier with impacting the plants. It really beats the plants up, the, the, the PM sun. Um, uh, those fall more under partial shade, uh, uh, partial sun. Those are two to three hours without that direct sunlight. Maybe that's that PM sun you want to avoid then. So plant that in a place that might only get the morning sun or a partial shade, which is only four to five hours of direct sunlight. Uh, you might want to plant that in an area that, that might be able to take more of that PM sun. But with full sun, full shade and dense shade, you really you kind of have no direct sunlight with that. With full shade, it's uh, you get really reflective light off of a building, and then dense shade if it's underneath a tree or if it's in the corner of a building. Those are very difficult places to kind of get things to grow. But we have options for that. Before I mentioned turf grass alternatives like ground covers, those really um, are impactful. And what we've, what University of Florida has come up with is this great publication, and I'll follow, um, and, um, and I'll give you guys a link for that. It's actually on the page now, and I'll drop it down soon. But we've, uh, the University of Florida has, has created the Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. Uh, this is the new one that was just released. I have a copy of it right here. This was just released in, uh, I think, 2022. They just released a new one, so they just started printing them now. We're very excited to see it. But what this does is it breaks down plants by, let's say I have large shrubs here. They have different sections like small trees. I have large trees. We also have ground covers, grasses, palms. And it tells you kind of in each one a little bit of the breakdown of like what type of sun, where it wants to be planted, the pH requirements. So we've done kind of all that homework for you and we've put it together in this catalog and it makes plant selection incredibly easy. And also there's design help in here to help you kind of pick the, pick the spots in your yard and where to put the plants. It's, it's a really good useful tool. 
So, um, and it's also available as a website and a phone app. If you go on Apple Store or Google Store and do FFL Plants, you'll find the app. I have a picture of it on the right. You can actually put in your zip code and tailor exactly for the area you're in. Say it's um, you want a ground cover and it's for the deep shade in my area. It'll it'll give you a list of the plants that are Florida friendly landscaping. So this is a great tool and a resource for you guys uh, when you're trying to determine right plant, right place. Always, if you have any questions, check with us at Extension. Uh, my phone number is the link on the bottom below. That 54146 is my extension. Uh, and you can find me there. And I love to talk about plant selection, plant design, and helping with this book. Uh, another great tool that we've, the University of Florida has, has created, this is uh, the, a website. This is called the UFI FIS Assessment of Non-Native Plants. This is a great tool so that you can understand the plants that we've deemed kind of prohibited or have been labeled invasive. And so they analyze each plant every 10 years. So the, there's certain plants that are being analyzed this year and they'll update and then they do it every, um, every 10 years. So it's really neat. I put up a QR code if anybody has tried it. That's going to take you to a pre-selected list of prohibited uh, plants. So these are ones we don't want at all uh, anywhere in Florida. So these can get you familiar with a lot of them. And, and um, really great tool right there. I have some pictures here to kind of show some examples of wrong plant, wrong place. And um, this one's kind of an obvious one. They put an oak tree next to the palm. No, so wait, the, uh, the palm tree kind of is growing up into the oak tree, right? That wasn't by design. That's probably definitely been blown in with the, uh, the wind. Maybe a bird dropped that. But those seeds, our palm seeds, get everywhere. And if we don't kind of pull them out and stop them, they can turn into this, um, this mess, really. And that's a kind of a nightmare of a, of a situation. You're going to probably have to take out that entire small shrub to kind of work and get that and to get the palm out. So you can see it's growing through the canopy of the tree. So this is definitely wrong plant, wrong place. Uh, this is a maintenance thing. That plant should have been removed. The next one, this might not be so obvious on this, we can definitely see the, the, the plebago in the middle kind of going over on the walkway, but a lot of the plants along the side are really high maintenance plants. Really? Those are plants that you're going to consistently have to prune to keep kind of low. They want to grow bigger. So we really want to put those kind of on our, on our outside, our border plants. We'd use those kind of as a fencing or kind of a security blanket there, not necessarily in front of, I would say a window or, or a doorway. Um, I would want those plants a little bit lower so I can have a visibility of security for myself. I might want to have a tree in that area above those shrubs, but still keep an, an, a, a nice layer so I can visibly see out for safety and security. Uh, and definitely we don't want to have them cascading over over onto the sidewalk. That doesn't help. Uh, this one, this one's pretty interesting. So I don't know how comfortable that jacuzzi or that pool is. They shouldn't keep you from going out and um, stopping that tree from popping through your screen. If you do see, <laughs> if that's gone to that point there, you haven't seen that plant in a while. And um, that's definitely wrong plant, wrong place. That's a strelitzia, which is a white bird of paradise. And it's growing through a screen. It's kind of, kind of funny. Um, so moving along with that, we're going to go now into water efficiently. So we've gotten our right plants. We know where we're going to put them in. So now we got to water them efficiently. What we use, we will consider high volume irrigation still work, but we want to see about 50% of that, um, under 50% high volume irrigation. Uh, we want that system to be set to about a half inch to three quarters of an inch per application. Uh, and um, there's ways that you can test that. Uh, which is really neat. There's a catch can set up where you'll get in. Um, actually, I have a slide for that next. So I'll talk about that next. But we want to monitor the weather and adjust our system. So if it's going to rain and we know that it, um, our system's going to turn on, we might want to offset that. Now, a smart way to do that is there's controllers that are already installed. They um, they are on. You can have them on the, the roof of your house. There's also soil moisture sensors that can go in the ground to give you a more accurate reading too. But what these do is if uh, your system is scheduled to run that day and it's rain and it does 
uh, uh, rain does fall about a half inch worth, it'll turn your system off until it's ready for the next one or until the, it doesn't rain, really. So it's a very good system to kind of um, safeguard overwatering and underwatering, really. So for that, we want to see that uh, separate zones for turf and landscape plants kind of have the same type of system on there. So if you're going to have a high volume in one area, make sure they're all the same heads and make sure they're all high volume. And if you're going to have what we prom promote is micro irrigation, like I see on the on well, my first picture here and here, that's just a very small drip irrigation tube that's there. It's under 30 gallons per minute of water. Um, 30 gallons per hour under a half a gallon per minute. Sorry about that. Uh, so that is a very slow drip. We can run that for a little bit longer and still provide the water to the plant without uh, heavy soaking it really. So this allows it to, to kind of percolate and absorb into the ground. Uh, so it's a low flow irrigation. I love micro irrigation. We have a, a, a class, the triple workshop at the end of, or the first Saturday of every month. Our last one is in November. We stopped them for December and January or November and we start we start them back up in February is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but we offer a micro irrigation kit in that course. Uh, we have I'll follow up with all of this information um, at the end of this too. So that catch can method that I was talking about looks like this. What we want to do is get similar cans like cat food cans or tuna cans, and we want to put them kind of uh, systematically around. This is kind of like uh, set for like in between twelve. 12 feet if your head is 12 foot long. So you'll put one at two foot, you'll put the next one at six foot, you'll put another one at 10 foot and um, run your system. And so you'll run it for 20 minutes and then you measure it. If you have a half an inch in there, then you know, okay, I run my system for 20 minutes. I'll have a half inch. That's a perfect, that's uh, my system is calibrated there. So this is a very, very awesome way to calibrate your system. I'd recommend doing this periodically, probably seasonally, probably four times through the year, really, to make sure it's you're, you're, you're on point. Uh, another way, uh, what I like to use uh, for watering efficiently, if you don't have a system or an in-ground, something like that, you want to design and you want uh, to maintain it accordingly to that. So what I use for there is the garden hoses. I'll fill up a, uh, I'll use my hand, hand watering tools and such like that. Um, or a rainwater harvesting barrel could come in handy, which is also a part of our triple workshop um, the first Saturday of every month. And our last one is coming up in November. But there's also a course, a class on there so that you can learn about rainwater harvesting. And as well, we provide a barrel for you that is got a spigot on there. And it's everything you're you're going to need to start collecting and saving water. That is, um, again, that's our triple workshop. So, so check those out. So from watering efficiently, we know our system's on, we're watering good, our plants are in the ground. We're going to now talk about fertilizing. That's our third principle. So with fertilizing appropriately, we want to first know that the plants need fertilizer. We want, what I do is I use, I, I look. So on the left here, I got a picture of some palms that are showing a very distinct, always, um, a nutrient deficiency. I'm so, uh, it's showing yellowing that is mirroring through the bottom leaves. Uh, when we see that, when we see like the yellowing and it's like on every leaf and it's almost on the same, then you can kind of determine that could be a fertilizer deficiency. We're not really thinking it's a pest or maybe a disease. We're, we're looking at the mirroring going, okay, it needs food. And with palms, when they do the lower leaf yellowing like that, that's that's magnesium is what they're deficient on. So that's would lead me to go, okay, that plant might need fertilizer. Now, before I, I want to fertilize, one thing I want to do is I want to know. So I want to get a, a soil test done. There are two options of soil tests that we can provide for you guys at extension. Uh, for $3, we do a soil pH test. Uh, that test is the alkalinity or the acidity of your soil. And uh, it'll tell you exactly what plant will work best there. Uh, so our sandy soils in Florida kind of uh, stay in between a 5.8 to a 6.3. And uh, so if you were going to plant something like Exora or blueberries, that might be a, a little bit lower, like a 5.5. Well, getting a soil pH test, that's going to help you know for sure that my plants are going to do the best in the spot that I'm choosing for them. So again, this is better for plant selection and location. 
for fertilizing, what I'd like to do is a soil fertility test. Now that's $10 and we send that out to Gainesville and it gives you a breakdown of the macro and the micronutrients that are in your soil and that are readily available to your plants. It'll also tell you uh, for your lawn, lime requirements, and that just kind of helps adjust the pH. But the nutrients under there are, are kind of are what they will tell you is available in your soil and what to amend with it. And again, this is what I like to use before I, I purchase my fertilizer. So uh, I like I, I emphasize on the purchasing. So before I want to get that result back, so then I know I'm shopping for the right product. This is now, this is soil kit. This is our, this is a new one that just kind of came to us. We're partnering with the Warner family part, uh, partnering with the Warner family here. And this is a no upfront kit to you guys, which is really neat. You can get this at any extension. You guys can call me. I can mail this out to you. It's uh, no upfront cost, cost for the kit. It comes with everything that you see in that picture. And when you do register it online, it's a thirty-one ninety-five dollars uh, fee for that. But they're giving you a very modern digital report with, with really nice lab results. There's a web interface. There's also an, um, an app on your phone. So it's very modern. It's, it's um, very user-friendly is what I'm trying to say. And the recommendations that do come are UF IFAS science-based. So you get everything that you see to the left. It's very seamless uh, and, and they're making it very easy. So what these can actually do, I have a picture of what our soil test or, or what we fill out when we do our soil test at extension. And what's really cool is at the back side here, it's kind of got a little codes and they go over different varieties. So you can tell them, all right, I, I'm doing this test for my, my Bahia, which is a turf grass variety, or maybe I'm doing it for one of those um, landscape shrubs like Azalea or Exora that like a very acidic soil. Or you can tell them I'm doing it for my edible gardens, like my dooryard citrus or vegetable gardens and stuff. And they'll tailor the results for for what you're you're looking to to plant. So ideally now, remember the soil test is important before we're gonna actually buy our fertilizer or even put plants in there, honestly. You wanna know what the soil is going on um, there. So moving along to the fourth one is mulch, one of my favorites. Um, I, I, I've laid out a lot of mulch. I've, I've handled it a bunch, it's, it's fun. Uh, to get to get in in the mess of, but what it's really doing in the environment, it's helping to retain soil moisture. It moderates the temperature of the soil as well. It keeps it comfortable. It keeps it happy without doing too much too much regulating. Um, it it'll reduce runoff and erosion. It improves soil composition. It suppresses weeds, which is one of the best benefits. It also enhances the beauty of the landscape while providing an increased area for root growth, and it prevents damage from lawn equipment. Now, the last one I like to hit on a lot because maintenancing, if it's, it, I'll be honest, I've done maintenance and if it's not, if it's kind of a, a challenge, I mean, sometimes it's really hard to to do a good job if, if you're kind of bent in a bad position or if you're kind of leaning really far. So I like how in this photo, you see on the side here along the fence where the protocarpus is up, they kind of have a walkway and a pathway kind of that kind of divides their, their perennial garden from kind of encroaching into the fence line. So as somebody for maintenance thing, that's very clean and easy to maintenance. And that provides um, a nice walkway too. And so I, I, I like mulching in that area. I like mulching in the front, how they've kind of put the little barrier around the grass. It, it, it adds a lot of, of aesthetics as well as the benefits that do come. So mulching is great. So in Florida, we kind of consider um, we have a Florida friendly list of, of mulches that we like Our organic ones that we, we recommend are Maluca, pine bark and pine needles, uh, eucalyptus. You can use grass clippings. They break down quickly, but they provide actual nutrients pretty quickly to the plants. Uh, and then your dyed ones are your mixed hardwoods and then also fallen leaves from your oak trees. You can rake those up and instead of putting them in the bags and out on your, uh, on, on the porch for the trash to come, you can lay them around your bedding as well. And if it's something like you don't like the look of it, well, then you can put them underneath and kind of put like those pine barks on top of them and buy less of the bags from the big store. It's kind of a, a, a way to save money there. We consider inorganic ones like crushed shell, gravel, and rock, not necessarily mulches, but we like to use those as accents, maybe on a pathway or along the drip line of your house is a very good place for crushed shells. They're not necessarily the best to be 
fully mulched with plants involved. They just absorb a lot of heat and, and can really damage the plants and make them kind of really un unhappy in their environment. And also, we just do not recommend using rubber mulch at all. They they just they break down. They're toxic. They're not environmentally friendly. And with cypress mulch, it's been around for so long. We can't confirm the um, if they're doing it appropriately or not. So cypress mulch without without knowing really, we just can't recommend it. Uh, it's they kind of don't do as they say they do kind of with the cypress mulch industry. And then really important when we're laying down our mulch, we want to keep a depth of about two inches to three inches. And that's after settling. You want to kind of just make sure we keep that evenly throughout. That's the good area to keep a lot of the weeds out and allow the moisture to, to control itself without becoming too moist. Um, this is an example of we put too much mulch. We consider that volcano mulching. And really, that is just too much moisture for the plant. It uh, Insects, pest disease, small rodents can just really just thrive there. So what it actually will do is create a lateral root. Roots can kind of start growing out there thinking it's 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 down le uh, down below. But what this does is it, it encircles and we consider that kind of a girdle. So you'll get a root kind of coming out that'll reach around the bark of the, or the, the stem and then it starts growing and it'll choke out the tree. That's a girdle. It's very hard to fix it once they're set. And uh, it really damages the plants. And, and, and as soon as you see the symptoms, they're kind of really out. So again, we want to we want to do a depth of two to three inches of, of mulch after settling. And really, we want to leave about a foot to 16 inches from the base. If we're using like a tree in this example right here, that's going to give the tree a nice little root flare. We want to see that root flare at the bottom there. Um, so we have our mulch and now we're going into the, we want to attract wildlife. Um, vines, shrubs, trees, they all provide habitat and food because animals need to move from place to place just like people, right? Uh, they have travel troubling in our heavy urban and suburban landscapes. And um, so we can help them actually by joining our Florida Friendly Yards and others in, in, with other neighbors and such and kind of creating a natural corridor is what we're trying to promote with that to allow our wildlife a safe little area to, tra uh, to traverse. So, uh, so what else you can do is nectar plants to attract pollinators, milkweeds for um, the monarchs. So you can also provide water sources for wildlife in uh, a bird bath you can do a little rock plate i've seen those are kind of neat you can do a little fountain honestly we have a the three bubbling pots in the discovery garden at, at extension and uh, i've seen a bird fly in there and kind of do a little dip it's it was kind of neat to see i never thought they would go for the bubbling pots but they will go for a bubbling pot that's kind of nice um am i next slide there we go so, like I said, with the bird bath up there, we can provide um, a nice little bath for them. On the left there, on the little one there, I got a um, supplemental food for them and a bird feeder. And then on the bottom, so we like to provide food for them, wildlife with the, the berries and the trees and stuff that we do promote or the, to plant. So these are just, we want to attract the wildlife, you know, help them out a little bit. Uh, one thing, so moving on to the next one, one thing we want to kind of also to help them, to help wildlife is we want to manage our yard pests responsibly. I have um, this guy on the left. He's uh, kind of our bad example guy for, for the time. He's using a lot of residual chemicals. He's kind of has the kill all mentality. He's got warning labels. He's going crazy, right? He's, he's going to go and spray all. Um, these are kind of harmful. We want to really... Um, we want to use an integrated pest management is what we call kind of IPM. We want to identify what we're going to spray first and note if it's a good pest or a bad pest, right? Um, on this slide, I kind of have examples of what we want to promote if we, for products. So OMRI is the um, Organic Material Review Institute. They are a nonprofit. And so they review products that are going into the organic grow that can be safe for organic grow without being labeled organic. 
Uh, these are OMRI. It's a very cool company. They're environmentally safe. And uh, one thing we always want to do is store store them above the ground, like I have in that example there. The guy on the left, he's got them on the ground, and he's ready to mix on the ground, which is a bad thing. So um, again, what I mean by managing uh, yard pests responsibly is with that integrated pest management, we want to identify the pest. We want to make sure, is it a beneficial pest, right? Or is it a pest? So when we say like beneficial pest and pest, I mean, beneficial insect and pest, 99% uh, of the insects that are out there, we consider beneficial. There's only about 1% out that we are considering pests that, that cause damage, that kind of disrupt things. And so if we go out there with that kill all, spray all mentality, we're taking out that 99% of the beneficials that are doing a lot of the good work for us. Uh, what I like to do is I go out and I scout about one to two, uh, every one to two weeks. Um, and I'm looking at the tops of the leaves uh, for symptoms, really. If they're kind of shrinking a little bit, if they're showing yellow, if they're showing holes, then I want to kind of go in there and really look under the leaf. Uh, you want to, uh, if it's, what we see is a bunch of things like I'm seeing here, we might go, oh, those are all pests. But honestly, what I have, everyone in here is a beneficial insect. The The first one that you see is definitely, that's a ladybug, lady beetle. Um, what it's doing is it's eating an aphid. The aphid is actually a pest of the plant. And that is what you see in the, the, the second leaf that's all underneath the leaf. So the third picture, that's actually the larva or the, or the young state of the lady beagle. Uh, and it looks completely different. And so they actually are eating aphids as well too during that period. It's all they pretty much feed on. So we want, we really want to make sure if they're doing their job, kind of let them kind of do it. If that, if it's an over an abundance of aphids, I might just kind of remove that one and, and see what kind of happens. But, um, if it's kind of over an abundance and, and you don't see any beneficials, then we really will spot treat that area. Um, and then also you want to read the directions of that, of that labeled bottle. Uh, I think I put, here we go. I put the, uh, them up on here. So yeah, I have the adult ladybug there, the ladybug larva here. And, um, on the bottom one, I like to show that the lace wing larva that's eating one, they look just like a, uh, a lady beetle. So these are beneficials that are out there. Like the um, the mummy wasp, the assassin bugs, the ground beetles, praying mantis are actually a beneficial insects out there. So um, some insects they go after are going to be the aphids, your scales, your chinch bugs, your spider mites. So these are really important when when you do go out there and start thinking about spraying in the yard. We want to know that hey, there's a lot of beneficials out there that if I if I let them do their job, they might actually get this under control. Uh, so. So moving from there, we're going to talk about recycling. And when we talk about recycling, we're really talking about like your landscaped, uh, your your trees, all the waste and stuff, your trimmings, your leaves, your pine needles, all the waste that are used from your landscaping. Instead of bagging them up or putting them in your trash can out for them to pick up, you can actually compost a lot of this stuff as well as your kitchen scraps from your cooking. Um, you can do... Uh, plant parts, like I was talking about, you want to kind of keep away from your animal waste and such, but you can reduce a lot of the stuff that's going to our landfill and that's going to our, our recycling uh, facilities. Uh, we offer on our triple workshops, we offer a compost class and, um, Heather also offers them throughout the month online and you can take this class and you can come by and we provide a compost bin for you with a thermometer and everything to get you started composting at home and uh, it's a really 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 awesome way to recycle and to put nutrients back into your yard is really recreates amendments for your soil um, with stuff that you already own so I have on the left here, this is kind of just like a leaf open bin. There's the little thing that's sticking in there is to help kind of steer it up. And it, it just kind of just sits there. Uh, the ones on the top are more enclosed. Those are a little bit faster. So they break it down a little bit quicker. Uh, you still have to open it up and get in there and turn it. But uh, with it being concealed like that, it heats it up more and, the, and it just breaks it down a little bit quicker. You can get those, those soils like that. So recycling is, is, is very important in the landscape. And, and we love promoting that with composting. So ultimately now, what all of the right plant, right place, making sure our, our, our mulch is there, making sure our watering is calibrated, our irrigation system set. We're just trying to reduce stormwater runoff. And what stormwater runoff really is, is um, 
pollutants that enter our, our water bodies that might come off of our roofs, our roads, our gutters, and our yards that get into our stormwater drains. We want to we want to keep those out. And uh, like on the left here, did you see that porous path? That's awesome. That's a that's an area that will just as the water's going down, it'll percolate through the cracks there and then actually absorb evenly throughout the yard there instead of kind of channeling all the way down or pocketing on the side, creating erosions, right? On the left, on, on the right there, that's a, uh, that is one of the rain barrels that you can install at your house there. We have the downspout going into there. We have an overflow valve going into the ground. So really that's about 55 gallons of water that you can save. That's free irrigation from the sky. We can use those on things like our landscaping plants. We can wash our cars with that. Uh, one thing though, we don't, want to put it on edibles there was a uf study done that the residues and stuff coming off the roof just might not be the best things to go into our edibles so it's not really recommended for edibles but it is there's a lot of other things that you can utilize that for um and some other things that you can do instead of a rain barrel would be something like a rain garden you can do a swale or a berm uh and this is used to catch and filter storm water i have a pretty cool diagram this is kind of what a rain garden looks like and how you can do it this really helps to filter and reduce uh roof and landscape runoff if you kind of have an area in your landscape that might collect water after a heavy rain but then after a couple of hours you notice it does kind of slowly trickle out where you can increase the uh, amount of stormwater pollutants you take out by kind of you can and here we have rocks on the outside which slow it down a little we have plants that can sit in water and also can take drought um, but they, the plants there do a lot of the work for us. It also controls erosion, like I said, by slowing down that water. Uh, and, and ultimately, it's reducing our stormwater pollutants. The, uh, we have a bog, we call it, um, at our, in our Betty S. Walker Discovery Garden. And that's what you see here on the right, uh, that larger picture. That's when it was first installed. It's, it looks beautiful. We have the rocks on the outside. We have some native uh, pitcher plants, which are carnivorous plants, and they do really well in wet, wet environments. Uh, and so we put them there. On the left is, is a kind of a swale, right? So that's kind of a, a, a directional where they're taking the water and moving it on the side. It's a path of rocks, which is really neat and, and, and a great use of rocks there. And then they've, they've um, incorporated plants on the outside to kind of absorb and to take the nutrients out. So that's reducing the stormwater runoff. And what we're trying to do ultimately is protecting the waterfront. I think that kind of um wraps it all up it's the ultimate goal of what we're going here you know we want to manage our yard waste to protect our surface water resources uh and so uh what we come up with and this is kind of um i have a publication that i'm going to put out with you guys i have it here to show it it's a uh, healthy ponds right so buffer zones this is a really cool thing that university of florida is starting to come out with now and they're they're starting to look at um common areas and ponds and these stormwater ponds that are in our neighborhoods and our HOAs. And they're really trying to create a buffer zone, what we want to call of uh, plants, really like a 10 foot zone about um, outside of the lake. Uh, like you see here, we have the trees, we have red maples, we have some cypresses. Uh, those can be grounding. They can really anchor in right on the edge of that bank and kind of keep erosion controlled with that still absorbing nutrients as we go down and we hit into that riparian zone and then we kind of emerge into the one foot of the water and then we get into the littorial zone which is actually in water so we have about 10 feet of a buffer zone on the outside of the pond and we have about a five to five to eight foot littorial zone in the water and this is doing the ultimate same thing as that rain garden um and all the all the water that's going into it is getting picked up and absorbed by the plants. The plants are absorbing those nutrients, they're absorbing um, all of the pollutants that would get into our our waterways and really just kind of create a create an abundance of algae and, and stuff we want to not promote. Um, this is kind of um, an example of plants that we can put in the littoral zone and in our on our buffer zones. And I have two examples and I was um, I forgot to put my X's on these, but I have a good and a bad guy. So with our water hyanthus here and our pickerel reed, they're in the same family of the Pontheraria, 
but the water hyantis is actually a very aggressive grower where it'll choke out and take over uh, a, a, a waterway very quickly. So that is one that just is, um, that's, a, I believe it's prohibited, but I think it's on a high evas evasive risk that is just not promoted at all. Instead, we will definitely pick the pickerel weed that does, it stays in its place. It, it, it's very um, right there in the toriel zone and it puts out a nice flower too. So we can still get that aesthetic. Uh, the next two are kind of a grass type. We have torpedo grass. That is actually a very bad invasive uh, plant for it. It'll take over an area. And once you do get that, you got to kind of get into the um, expensive aquatic herbicides and just do multiple, multiple applications. So it's just not fun. So establishing them correctly with like something like a soft stem bulrush, it's a little bit of a larger species. It's still doing the same job of um, reducing the stormwater pollutants that can be getting in there, but this isn't going to spread out. It's not going to go crazy like a torpedo grass will. Uh, this is just a, a couple of examples of the plants that I like. I have some pictures now of kind of a whole system in here. And what I want to emphasize here is we really want to promote a, a, a no mow zone is what they call. And, uh, and here's an example of an area where they kind of have a zone that is going to, to be mowed. And, um, uh, the takeaway here is you just, you never would want the grass. If they were going to cut it, you never want to point your, um, your shoot at the waterway. We would always want to just kind of be mowing so that we're sending the, the, um, the cuttings away from the lake, never into the lake. That's going to just put a lot of excess nitrogen and stuff that's going to break down and feed that algae. So if we can keep it out, that's perfect. That's what we're trying to do with all the plants. Um, an example of, so um, this is the other corner of it. And I'm uh, just to show you that these taller plants here are in that littoral zone. They're in a foot of water and they actually do a lot to provide food, shelter and habitat for uh, the wildlife that you would say live in that little littoral zone in that one foot zone. This is another community right here where they've actually done a great a great example of a buffer zone. We have the cypress right there. We have sort of that um, layered textured layer, kind of 10 foot zone, not just one plant, right? We have multiple plants that the water can kind of really get slowed. The nutrients can really get uptake there. Uh, and this encompasses the entire, um, the pond, there's no mow area, right? So they're doing a very good example of that. No mow zone. All right. Um, so that ends with the nine principles. And uh, what I'm going to cover on now is uh, what I do with the nine principles is a, a program called the uh, FFL Florida Friendly Landscaping Home Yard Recognition. Right? It's um, it's easy to compete uh, complete. Uh, I have a um, there's a checklist honestly that uh, I will provide in the follow up. And so it's really cool. You can fill out this checklist, which really helps you kind of gauge where you are uh, at with your landscape. Um, and you turn this into me. And then I can kind of assess it. Then I come out and evaluate your property and we go, okay, is it silver or gold? There's two statuses that you can, that you can get. And it's a recognition program. You get this flag. It's a um, great way to meet evaluators like myself. We always provide our science-based recommended suggestion. Um, and then with a flag like that, you can make envious neighbors and, and, and kind of have some bragging rights uh, and, and such like that. Kind of motivate your neighbors to help create that wildlife corridor that we we're talking about. And, um, so it's a really cool thing. It, once you're recognized, we do it every, um, every two years, we come out and do a re-recognition. So we do up, upkeep on that program and make sure you're doing the maintenance and up and, and doing all of that correctly. And I have some examples of some, uh, some Florida friendly winners in the past. So just to show you guys here, this is, um, they, they did a beautiful job with some ground covers. We have Asiatic Jasmine in the front there. They've incorporated some variegated flax lily. They do have some, some, some pots in there, but it's, it, it's aesthetically pleasing. It has a flow to it. It looks really nice. Uh, they do have, um, some turf area, but it's been reduced so that they can maybe just go out and walk to play with the plants. Nice little walk around area there. This is very, this is a very good example of a Florida friendly gold landscape. Uh, so this is the backyard. This is Florida friendly as well. We have, you know, it, it, it kind of looks like it might be a little not maintained, but it's, it's very well, um, established. You would say, uh, the details are there. You have a nice pathway there. You can see the mulching. You can see the plants are, are in the right place. And, um, uh, there's right there in front of us is, is water for, for wildlife. So 
this is a, a grand idea of for a backyard right here. Um, and this is just one of the favorite ones that I love to show off. Just the colors are really nice. I really like the pop there. Uh, they do have a lot of um, open space there, low plants, but that's okay. Uh, they're providing shade. They're providing nutrients, and uh, they're they're just they're doing a great job. Um, so that wraps up pretty much my thing here. Uh, I can open this now up to questions. I don't know where my there we are. I don't know where the whole thing went. Where <laughs> Teams kind of just I'm on a laptop here, so Teams is super good at that. But what I will do I is you. go ahead and pull up our slides here and get the library slides up and running in the background. And I'm going to check out chat right now, which I haven't been able to see the whole time. Uh, so we've we've had a couple of questions come Excellent. in. So folks at home, I'm going to encourage you if you have not yet get your questions into the chat box. I'm going to talk about a couple of other things before we get to the Q&A, but definitely get those questions in as we go along. I've got a couple already in and ready. While you're doing that, I'm just going to let you know that we do have a QR code up on the screen right now that is a shortcut to the extension office, um, the Master Gardener program specifically. So it's not quite the Florida Friendly Landscaping direct link, but it is the Master Gardener link. I just dropped it into the chat as well. And those folks are always happy to point you over to Michael's office mm -hmm. as well. If you're Definitely. if you reach the one and need the other, they're they're happy to to point you in the right direction. And they know where and, to find me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and while we see those questions coming in, I'm gonna tell you about two library books you might want to check out on this topic. We have Florida's Best Native Landscape Plants, because who doesn't love to browse through a book of all the wonderful things that we can plant in our yard and what better way to do it with Florida native ones. So Good. got some nice uh, 200 readily available species. So not only is it native, but they're actually readily available according to this book. And the other book I picked is Native Florida Plants for Drought and Salt Tolerant Landscaping, which is okay. also a very important consideration. And this book very conveniently is available on Hoopla Digital, which means with your library card, you can check it out literally right now. You don't have to wait for your local library branch to open. You don't have to wait for a copy to get sent to your branch from another branch. You just log into Hoopla Digital with your library card and you can get that book right now but you know wait until after the program we've we've still got some goodies coming up so we've got those questions rolling in mm -hmm. i've got our contact information up on Thank the slide you. here so um if you need to reach the library for anything hcplc.org contact has all of our contact information on that page give us a ring 813-273-3652 I've got uh, the Master Gardener email on there. Uh, if you need some quick reference, they are always super happy to help out. And of course, keep an eye on the library calendar for more Master Gardener programs here virtually, online, or in your local branch. We have a bunch of them starting up throughout the county, so check for those. I see we've got lots of questions yeah. coming in already, including somebody, you were talking about the water hyacinth earlier yes. and somebody pointed yes. out that you need a permit for it but i will add to that mm -hmm. that there are two different kinds of water hyacinth mm -hmm. one is federally on the no no right. absolutely bad bad list and then both of them are on the florida no no bad list so right. check which kind you're looking at specifically yeah yeah the one i have is off of the ufifis assessment list yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah so, yeah so, so yeah uh, so should I just go from the top that I see in the chat? I think Absolutely. the first question was up good. there. Great. So I think the first one that I'm seeing here was asked, I'm looking for turf graft alternative. I have some dwarf jasmine that is growing, but the growth is very, very slow. It can it can do that. Yes, it can seem slow until it gets kind of a mature and takes off. Uh, so for one that works better in the full sun and partial sun, I definitely would recommend it's perennial peanut. Um, this mm -hmm. is uh, an amazing one. It has a little yellow flower. It's a nitrogen fixating. It uh, can take actually traffic very well. It's sold as sod. You can buy this on it's a pallet. It's so lush and green. It's awesome. Yes. No, there are um, a couple of uh, providers in um, in our area that actually that's, that sell it as surf. So it's easily to find too. You can definitely find that. And uh, that is a perennial peanut. I will um, 
put that up there. So, okay, so the next question I see is to clarify the mulching around the tree. Should I leave a 12 inch area of bare soil? No. So what I meant by that is um, really now, so the tree's gonna come down and there's gonna be kind of a, a, a flare is what we're gonna call it. So at that flare, at the bottom of the flare, that's kind of like a ring right there of a normal seed. That's going to be probably right, right at the end of the flare is where I would put it. Um, 12 to 16 inches is, is a ballparking. It's generally to the size of the tree too. So if we have kind of a smaller tree that doesn't quite have a big flare, I might then just go to that 12 inch and just keep it there. There might be some bare, bare spots there. Uh, if you're worried about weeds, there are pre-emergence that could kind of handle that. Or if you really can, don't want to use any chemicals, just do a very lighter layer up to what we will be the flare of the tree. Just don't put the up to the bark, honestly. We just don't want to pile it on there because that can create that moisture area. Okay. Um, and thank you for asking, or for somebody for posting about that permit, about the hyanthus. I appreciate that. Um, for uh, So what are proper ways to compost, compost weeds? And that's really <laughs> awesome. So we would just say, don't put them in there, I think is uh, what Heather kind of promotes. Uh, we don't want to encourage them at all. Uh, even if you do have kind of that hotter, uh, there are kind of other ways to do hotter composting, which can kind of take out those seeds. But just in general practice, if we're doing our our slow base kind of compost piles, the, it, it just keep them out. It's the best way to do that. Uh, those you can burn or do something, get rid of them. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, just definitely would not compost those. The dog's name, I don't know which you saw. Now I got my, she's, I got my other supervisor here. I got Katz who's in her spot. And then I had Tucker was in the chair for me the whole time. So um, they, they, they were actually well behaved. I'm, I'm impressed. So for the next Master Gardener program, I don't know if that starts in two years or not. I know that uh, Tia is our new Master Gardener agent and they are in week six now. So they're just doing it now. Uh, so I don't know what her plans are for next year or if she is. So, uh, she would be the contact for that. Her name is Tia Savicia. She is awesome. And she is at our extension. And we've got that email address right up on the screen oh. right now. It's hillsmg at ad.ufl.edu. Edu. That's their help desk's email address, and they they will be super able to answer that question for you there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm seeing a question here about my arch nemesis, and I have a follow up <laughs> question to the patron's question. Okay. Um, air potatoes. Mm -hmm. um, it, it says bad even with hot composting, while others die at higher temps and Yes, that's that's absolutely oh, yeah. true. Uh, air potato will survive the nuclear Armageddon. I'm pretty convinced. <laughs> yeah. So, Michael, my question specifically for the air potato uh, issue is one that I was going to pick somebody's brain on because mm -hmm. it used to be that, and I think it was through the extension office, is that you could get the air potato beetles, those mm -hmm. obligate beetles that ate yes. only uh, potato vine. Yes. But then they found that that could, beetle has since established itself in Florida. So they stopped the program because, you know, it's out there. It'll eventually mm -hmm. find the vines. Right. I don't know about uh, other folks, but um, I don't think they found my yard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so while the extension office doesn't have that as a resource anymore, uh, do they have like a commercial resource that they point to for people who still want to maybe get a giant jar of those air potato beetles? Uh, I don't know if we would actually, because one thing we just don't do is we can't promote a private business or anything like that. So we wouldn't be able to specifically put a name on anything like that. We might have humane ways to eradicate it or just solutions for that or how to, how to search for a solution, but we can't give an actual business. So sorry about that. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a little quick here and I'm going to try to see if I can find a, a, a recent publication, but I think the most recent one that I'm seeing for air potatoes, if we search on EDIS is from June 16, 2021. So I, I don't know if there's any updated there, information. I, I recently read there is a new uh, kind of beetle oh. that they're focusing efforts on. I believe that's probably what you're looking at for that one. Oh, I, yeah, I just found one from uh, 2023 and yep, the Cleopatra, they're talking about some yeah. biological control from air potato vine. So, Right. Yeah, no, this is I'll share this publication and, and I'll research this. So thank you for mentioning that. That definitely gives me something to look forward to. Uh, so for the question about the permit for water hyanthus, I am 
I don't know that to, to, to be honest with you. Um, that is a great question. I, uh, I know that Sarasota extension, they do a lot of work with ponds and that's who I'm kind of learning from. They're establishing this new certification called healthy ponds. And I'm, and that's what I'm looking to learn from, uh, all of that from. So that's a great question. So I, I'm not, I don't know what would depend on the, and then the, okay. So is there any other questions? I'm not seeing any more. Do you, do you see any I'm that I'm double checking to make sure. Okay. Somebody asked me to put the QR code back up. Sure Excellent. thing. I've got that up here. I'm assuming you're talking about this QR code. I know Michael had one on his program okay. as well about the invasive plants. Mm -hmm. um, if that's the case, Michael, do you have a shortcut link to that invasive plants list? If not, I can mm -hmm. drop it real quick. Probably. Oh, yeah. if you got it before, I can find it. Yeah, I'm trying to grab it. I was going to say, I, I right definitely now. pulled up that QR code in the background while you were presenting. Nice. Yeah, if you, that assessment, that IFAS, that you have, that is the link that'll work. Do you got it? I got it. Pull that up here. I've got it right here. Go for it. And um, <laughs> I got it. Someone right, says perfect. that they can't see your screen, but I'm posting the assessment link right now. So that's assessment.ifas.ufl.edu. That's not a clickable link, but that will get you there if you copy and paste that and put that in there. Okay, it looks like Jeffrey can't see my screen. Uh, is anyone else not able to see my screen right now? Yeah, that'll work. There we go. Ah, it looks like my screen is. Michael, are you able to see my screen? Uh, on yeah, your I've end? seen. I, I've seen your camera the whole time, and I see your screen. Yes, I see it down there. We're on slide three of five. It's showing yeah. a QR code with a. Uh, huh. a Plant. Yeah. Unusual. Well, for the folks who are not able to see my screen, I apologize. Sometimes it is. Oh, so somebody can't see it. So nice. it's it, it is apparently having its moment of maybe feeling like it, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're doing that and wrapping up here, I am going to just launch a little feedback poll uh, on the side here. So you're welcome to um, let us know what you think about the program. Uh, those are anonymized, so feel free to, to click those and click through them. It's a little seven question poll in the background. And uh, while you're doing that, I will thank Michael for uh, that great q and A. I I love a good troubleshooting session. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a wonderful program. I love all the ways that we're able to really uh, tackle these problems that plague all of us by real some really common sense things but also really using that science-based research-based solid yes. information that really helps us uh, promote our native uh, flora and help our little uh, insect buddies out there that are mm -hmm. taking care of things so love to see that like I said, if you have any trouble uh, following up with Master Gardener or the library, just reach out to us, hcplc.org slash contact. Uh, it'll be, uh, we're happy to get back in touch with you. If you forgot how to get in touch with Michael, uh, but you remembered me, reach out to me or vice versa. We, we're, we're, all, uh, we're all on the same team here with the county. Uh, so just let us know if you have any follow-up questions after the program, we're very happy to help. Uh, and with that, I will thank everybody for joining us. Thank you again, Michael. Mm -hmm. Thank you to yes, your uh, you. to furry assistants. <laughs> uh, always a pleasure. And folks at home, I hope you can join us again soon for another Master Gardener program. We have them on the schedule for both virtual and in branches. So we'll see you then. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye, guys. <laughs>